Should we should we start? Have we got um, my son with us? I cannot see my son. Sorry. Yeah, he's here. All right. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Um, salam and good afternoon to all those who have joined us for the launch of this important research report. The report titled, We Will Make Pakistan Their Graveyard, Systematic Attacks Against Shia Hazaras in Quetta, Pakistan, between 1999 and 2022, is co-authored by Bismillah Alizada and my son El Tov, and will be published by Kursish Policy Research Institute later today. I am Anis Rizai, and I'll be, I will be moderating today's talk. I would also like to take this opportunity to express my gratitude to Kursish Research Policy Institute for the time and effort they have invested in organizing the launch of this report. Given that this is, an on, this is an original research which has yet to be published, it might be worthwhile to give you a brief overview of the study. This study is based on over 80 interviews, archival research and extensive desk research and presents a comprehensive account of systematic attacks against Hazaras in Pakistan's Baluchistan province and a comprehensive chronology of attacks that take place between 1999 and 2022. The report also contextualizes the history of Hazara migration to Pakistan, as well as the history of sectarian militancy in the country. Moreover, this study engages in critical discussion on the framing of these attacks and details their consequences at the individual, family, and community levels. It also covers state responses and community-led measures against the sustained violence on the Hazaras. I would like to express my heartfelt congratulations to Mr. Ali Zoda and Mr. El Tov for such a remarkable achievement. And I would like to thank them for making an incredibly important contribution to our collective knowledge of the struggles and resistance of the Hazaras in Quetta, Pakistan against an ongoing genocidal violence. Let me begin by briefly introducing the authors of the report. Mr. Ali, Mr. Bismillah Ali Zada is a PhD candidate at SOAS University of London, from where he also earned a Master of Science in Violence, Conflict and Development in 2020. Bismillah's research focuses on decentralization, political settlements, post-conflict institutional design, political participation, ethnic politics, and conflict. Mr. Arizada previously worked as deputy director at the Organization for Policy Research and, De and Development Studies in Afghanistan. In that position, he co-led all, all the research, advocacy, and capacity building activities of the organization. He also co-edited the third, fourth, and fifth volumes of the organization and peer-reviewed women and public policy journal between 2017 and 2019. Additionally, he co-founded Rahila Foundation, an organization working for youth empowerment through education and capacity building. His articles have appeared in Al Jazeera English, The Diplomat, Global Voices, and the Institute of Peace and Conflict Studies in New Delhi. He has also co-translated into, into Persian the book, China in the 21st Century, What Everyone Needs to Know. Mr. il -Tof, Mr. Iltov is, is a researcher and human rights activist. Mr. Iltov's research interests include refugees and forced migration, ethnic and cultural politics, identity and memory, and peace building, with a particular focus on Afghanistan and Pakistan. Like Mr. Ali Zoda, he is also a co-founder of Rahila Foundation, a non-profit organization working for youth empowerment through education and capacity building programs. Between 2015 and 2021, he worked with numerous international organizations in Afghanistan, including the American University of Afghanistan and RTP International. He is also a member of Am Amnesty International and has received the UNDP's End Peace Award in 2019. Mr. Iltov has also published with the diplomat, the geopolitics, the geopolitics and global voices. Please allow me also to say a word or two about Prestige Policy Research Institute. Prestige Policy Research Institute is an, is an independent nonprofit policy research think tank based in the United States. The Institute's mission is to produce fact-based analysis that informs constructive interventions and solutions. 
The Institute deeply values the impartiality, human-centered design approach, and vitality of contextualized knowledge in its studies. The institution emerged out of a historical tyranny and injustices in Afghanistan in 2015 as the only nonprofit research institution with focus, with, with focus on minorities, marginalized communities, and women. They have also advocated against the prevalent misinformation and disinformation machine that has deviated the trajectory of information, information history in Afghanistan. After the collapse of, of Afghanistan government to the Taliban in August 2021, the institution was forced to leave the country. The institute's leadership team, with the support of a passionate team of US colleagues, rebranded and registered as a US-based think tank with a wider mission to provide fact-based analysis and solutions to the most pressing policy issues. As you know, we also have the honor of hosting three distinguished speakers who will share their thoughts and insights about the research report. Let me briefly introduce our speakers. Dr. Melissa Chivanda is an assistant professor of anthropology at Syed University Abu Dhabi. Her ethnographic research focused on Hazara civil society activists in Bamiyan in Afghanistan. She focuses on the transmission of collective and cultural trauma through their, through their activist activities and its impact on political identity and subjectivity. Dr. Chivanda has been conducting ethnographic fieldwork with Afghan refugees in Athens, Greece since 2016, focusing on political and transnational placemaking. Dr. Chivanda has published extensively and is currently working on a book manuscript. We also have with us Dr. Farfanda Akbari. Dr. Akbari is a postdoctoral fellow at the Gender, Peace and Security Center at Monash University. Dr. Akbari completed a PhD in diplomacy at the Australian National University. She has worked with the United Nations headquarters in New York, the Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission, and Afghanistan's Independent Directorate of Local Governance in Kabul. Dr. Akbari is also an activist, using her research to advocate for human rights, especially the rights of women and girls and vulnerable ethnic groups in Afghanistan. And last but not least, we are joined by Dr. Ali Karimi. Dr. Ali, Dr. Karimi is an assistant professor of communication at, at the University of Calgary in Canada. He is a scholar of critical information studies with a focus on data justice, surveillance, and privacy. His research examines how the state's information practices can lead to the unfair distribution of resources. He, he studies this problem mostly in the context of Afghanistan and other weak states of the global, global South where data is often contested and information injustice is a major issue. Dr. Karimi received his PhD from Mac McGill University and before joining the University of Calgary, he was a postdoctoral fellow at the, at the Annenberg School for Communication, University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Karimi's publications include art articles on media, technology, and ethnic politics in Afghanistan. Greetings to you all, and thank you for joining us today. I will now finish by providing you with an outline of the event, which consists of three parts. Firstly, Mr. Ali Zoda and Mr. El Tof will present the key findings of the research report. This will be followed by a discussion from our guest speakers. We will then top it off with a 20 minute Q&A. I would like to encourage you to write your questions in the uh, comments section and I will put them forward to the, to the authors and our speakers. Without further ado, I pass the mic to Mr. Mr. El Tof and Mr. Ali Zoda. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Anis, for the wonderful introduction and opening. Um, I would like to begin by um, asking you for one minute of silence in the uh, in the memory of the uh, over 80 uh, nationals from Afghanistan who were um, drowned uh, very recently in southern Italy, which was very, very uh, tragic, very tragic event. And in fact, there was at least there were at least three uh, Hazaras from Pakistan um, among those who were drowned. One of them was Ms. Shahida Reza, who had presented Pakistan in many many international um, 
events uh, in sport. So we'll begin after one minute of silence. Thank you, everyone. I will begin by a disclaimer. Uh, the authors designed, conducted, and produced this study voluntarily. This effort was not part of any projects, and neither was it funded or supported any other ways by any individuals or institutions. The authors would like to acknowledge that some of the cost of this study was partially compensated by Persish Policy Research Institute. All the responsibility for shortcomings, mistakes, and misrepresentations rests solely with the authors. When depicting human suffering, the authors refrained from using extreme content and violent imagery, uh, but some readers may find some parts of this report disturbing and graphic. The authors would also like to express their gratitude to Mr. Asif Yusufi without whose dedication and commitment, this report would have been incomplete. He provided unwavering assistance in data collection, data entry, and preparing and cross-checking chronologies of these attacks. So as Anis also outlined, um, our presentation at the very beginning will include um, very brief and succinct explanation around the, um, the following uh, topics. First of all, why did we decide to conduct this study? Well, first of all, the prime motive behind us uh, deciding to do this study was the fact and the very unfortunate fact that there is not um, a thorough study and documentation of the systematic attacks against the Shia Hazaras in Kuwait of Pakistan. But at the same time, um, while there are a few reports, there are uh, problematic aspects to those reports. So some of those uh, problems pertain to um, the framing uh, that those reports have used uh, to present the systematic attacks against the Shia Hazaras in Pakistan, to which uh, I will come later, but also at the same time that the Hazara voices, uh, the voices from the community were largely absent from those reports. At the same time, the chronology uh, of the attacks presented in some of these reports were not methodologically strict and solid, and also all of those chronologies, without any exception, they were all incomplete. Uh, another very important shortcoming in the previous reports was the fact that the consequences of these attacks were not sufficiently addressed and sufficiently portrayed uh, and captured in the reports. And last but not least was the fact that the fact-checking processes and the cross-checking and methodology were very loose and insufficient. Uh, over to my Sam. You there, my Sam? Uh, thank you so much, Bismillah John. Um, we worked across a consistent methodology based on information gathering from a broad range of sources with uh, field based research at its core. Uh, therefore, this study draws on both primary and secondary sources using both quantitative and qualitative methods. Uh, primary data is based on two key elements as uh, and as John also mentioned, over 80 semi-structure in-depth interviews, most of which were conducted face-to-face -face in Quetta, has taken into account an exclusive, inclusive uh, approach that uh, when, we, when we sat with family members of victims, survivors, as well as Hazara political and religious figures, community leaders, 
uh, civil servants, experts, and other key stakeholders. And two is archival research, where most of our statistical data and historical facts come from. And this was largely conducted when we visited Balochistan Archives Department several times. Uh, secondary research uh, involved an extensive uh, method that included reviewing and compiling data that came from a variety of channels, including books, academic papers, reports, and more. The report uh, presents so far the most comprehensive chronology of attacks against Hazaras in and out of Quetta. These chronologies were prepared using a predefined matrix for each attack that includes the exact location, the exact date, uh, number of killed and wounded, type of attack, and the perpetrators. In terms of the typology of the attack, we categorized them into five broadly defined order that included target shooting, bomb explosion, suicide attack, uh, summer execution, and uh, rocket shelling. In doing so, we also conducted extensive review of at least 11 limited chronologies that were previously prepared by a range of organizations. Uh, moreover, we used, uh, we used findings from secondary literature reviews to both cross-check and complement um, missing information about each attack. Nevertheless, this study had its own set of uh, obstacles. First, uh, we had limited resources in the sense that we used our, as Bismillah said, we used our meager personal resources to conduct this study. So, uh, security and trust building were also uh, uh, other issues. Therefore, interviews were conducted under circumstances in which they could be carried out. In terms of trust building, some participants, primarily survivors and families of victims, cited mistrust and showed disinterest in sitting for an interview, uh, mainly because of the mistrust implanted uh, by some reporters and researchers in the past. Gender and ethnic dynamics were also a hurdle. Since the interviewer on the ground was male, it was likely that female participants might not have spoken about these stories and lived experiences in the way they would have spoken with a female interviewer. The Hazara ethnicity of the uh, interviewer added trust given the notion that some participants asked the interviewer if he was a Hazara or not before providing consent for sitting for an interview. Um, I'll stop here, over to you, Bismillah. Uh, to historicize and contextualize the um, life of Hazaras in Pakistan, We've also presented um, a detailed introduction and historical background at the beginning of the report. What Shia Hazaras um, moved to Pakistan and resettled in Pakistan in four big waves of migration from Afghanistan beginning in the 1890s. Uh, at the beginning of the early 1890s, as most of you may know, uh, there was a genocidal, systematic, uh, targeted violence, um, collective violence. Uh, by the then Amir of Afghanistan, Amir Abdurrahman Khan, as he was consolidating his um, power and a centralized state in Afghanistan. Um, Hazaras fled, um, those who had survived the massacre fled um, to Central Asia, to Iran, and uh, southward to Pakistan, which was then part of the British India. Other waves of migration followed in the 20th century due mainly to political turmoils in the country, uh, but also um, other uh, drivers, including poverty and the search for jobs, um, as Hazaras were also affected um, disproportionately by poverty. Uh, although there is no census available, no official census available on the um, on the population of the Hazaras in Pakistan. Uh, unofficial census estimate around 1 million uh, Hazaras uh, in Pakistan, across Pakistan in different cities, of which 600,000 of them are concentrated in Kuita, mainly in Mariabad and Hazara town. I'll show you the next slide. Um, so Mariabad is on the left, and Madawad is on the right and Hazara town is on the left, as shown in this picture. But of course, they are in other places in uh, Baluchistan as well, as um, detailed in the report. The Hazaras over, um, in over a century of their presence in Pakistan have also made major and significant contributions to the Pakistani society across fields, across uh, um, different um, parts of the society, in the army, in politics, in the society, in culture, in sports, um, and much more. 
Beginning in the late, um, in the second half of the 20th century, the Hazaras also began exercising political and social organizations. Uh, nearly three decades of collective experience in socio-political organization culminated in the formation of the first political party uh, of the community in 2003, uh, a political party that now uh, holds at least two seats in the Balochistan National Assembly, in the Balochistan State Assembly. But in addition to the Shia Hazaras, uh, about uh, whom we have heard a lot, uh, there is a sizable population of Sunni Hazaras. There's a sizable Sunni Hazara community in Pakistan who are ignored even by researchers and ethnographers. They migrated to Pakistan following the Soviet invasion uh, of Afghanistan in 1979. At least 800 families of uh, this community live in Pakistan, and particularly in Balochistan, and more particularly even in Qawsabad area. But in addition to these families, there are also 2,000 to 3,000 Karluk families who live uh, uh, across Balochistan. Um, and there is a, a confusion in terms of identity between the Karluk and the Shia uh, and the Sunni Hazaras. The 800 families, they uh, identify as Sunni Hazaras, and they're mainly from Kunduz of Afghanistan. But uh, from the 2,000 to 3,000 Karluk families, some of them also identify as uh, Hazaras. And some of the ethnog um, ethnographers and um, historians uh, working on the Hazaras have also uh, made it clear that Karluk are part of the Hazaras. But this is a contested issue, and this uh, plays out in the context of Pakistan as well. The Sunni Hazaras are largely integrated within the larger society. But, but they are even more disadvantaged than the Shia Hazaras, uh, both in terms of access to public services, in terms of their development, in terms of their growth. Uh, they also experience shifting identities and they exercise shifting languages between home where they speak Hazaragi dialect of Persian language and the society where they will need uh, to speak in other languages, including Urdu, Baluchi, Punjabi, and sometimes Sindhi. Uh, also sometimes Pashto, of course. They maintain traditional and social organizations, and then the traditional and social organizations are mainly around mosque, uh, which plays a very central role, but they also operate um, several private schools that are detailed in the report. Over to Baisan. Uh uh, thank you, Mr. John. Um, actually, the rise uh, in sectarian violence in Pakistan predates to the military rule of General Zeol Haq uh, in the late 1970s, when a particular pattern emerged uh, with far-reaching consequences for people in the country, and that and that later on also affected Hazaras uh, with ebbs and flows, thanks to. The old hacks, systematic Islamization policies that over the subsequent years incrementally radicalized the Pakistani society by penetrating deep into the country's social and political fabric. Uh, two major developments around this time also contributed to shaping and fueling this. First, the Iranian Revolution of 1979, when Ayatollah Khomeini had toppled the Shah regime to create a Shia dominated state. And second, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in the same year that eventually led to the emergence of the Afghan Mujahideen. In 1979, uh, Tehriki Jafariya, a Shia religious group, was born, which uh, trumpeted its initial goal as defending the Shia community. However, by 1985, it had turned into a Shia militant group known as the Sipai Muhammad. And in 1985, the anti Shia, uh, the infamous anti Shia and Sunni extremist outfit Sipai Sahaba, supported by the uh, Ziyar regime in mainstream Deob uh, Deobandi Sunni groups, was also founded uh, largely in reaction to uh, Tehrik Jafriya, but also to contain it. And it's since then that two groups have engaged in a deadly sectarian militancy beginning in the Punjab province and later stretched to uh, Sindh in the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, while the spate of attack continued to rage during this time, the sectarian militancy had not necessarily 
uh, engulf the Hazaras in Balochistan province. It is actually in 1998 uh, in Karachi and a year later in Quetta that the systematic attacks against Hazaras begin to surface and continues to date. Therefore, the systematic attacks against Hazaras post-1998 should be understood against this stated historical backdrop and other dynamics, including the role of madrasas, ethnicity, Baloch insurgency in the province that particularly heightened following the death of uh, Nawab Akbar Khan booked in uh, uh, 2006, and the local political um, e um, economy in, in Quetta. Now, the role of madrasas, which cannot be overlooked or ignored, is crucial to understanding the complex and multi-dimensional dynamics of the violence, because madrasas often not deliver the hotbed for hatred and terror, but also serves as a recruitment loop for militant groups. Uh, before turning Quetta into a slaughterhouse of Hazaras, Hazaras in Afghanistan born the bird of Spai Sahaba and its later offshoot splinter Lashkari Jangui, when their fighters fought alongside the Taliban in massacring the Hazaras in Balochistan, uh, sorry, in Mazar Sharif, uh, city of uh, Afghanistan in 1998. The anti Shia rhetoric is therefore visible in the past and current Takfiri narrative of these outfits who view Shias as, as, as Kafir, uh, meaning uh, infidel, uh, and thus, according to them, liable to be eliminated. Uh, between 1998 and uh, 2022, this research study has documented um, at least 276 systematic attacks against Shia Hazaras in Pakistan, 261 of which were carried out in Balochistan, mainly in Quetta, and the remaining occurred in Karachi and Lahore. As a, res as a result of the uh, 261 attacks in Balochistan, at least 1,046 Hazaras are dead and 1,262 wounded. Of course, uh, it should be taken into account that uh, some uh, many uh, uh, attacks have gone under reported or or even not re uh, reported um, more than 80% of the date as i mentioned uh, the number are hazara men be, uh, which grimly signals the gender dynamics of the violence as well as the dire implications on hazara women which will be discussed uh, in further slides as you can see the figure one on the screen, the attacks against the community begin with targeted attacks and assassination attempts when, uh, when select individual members were killed, who included Hazara doctors, politicians, professors, uh, religious figures, civil servants, lawyers, and more. A few mass attacks have also occurred during this time. Over the course of next years, the attacks kept diversifying and intensifying until their peak in 2012, when 75 attacks were carried out in that year alone, before taking an incremental downturn in the subsequent years. As a result, these attacks gradually took the shape of full-scale attacks against almost all social spaces of the community, effectively ghettoizing them into two enclaves. In terms, uh, in terms of the typology of the attacks, we, as, as, I, as I mentioned in the, uh, in the methodology, attacks were categorized into five broadly terms, uh, target shooting, suicide attack, and the rest. Uh, as you can see in figure six, nearly all of the attacks were target shooting, uh, while target shooting uh, uh, resulted in, uh, in fewer casualties, but, the, but, but it was enough to instill uh, perpetual fear uh, into the uh, uh, into the community, uh, and 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 that plagued uh, the morale of the of the of the community. Next, please. Almost all social spaces, including private premises, uh, were attacked against the Hazars between 1998, uh, later 1999 uh, in Quetta, uh, uh, until uh, uh, 2022. That included a health facility, residential areas, and the rest that you could see on the screen. In terms of the perpetrators of the attacks, as I mentioned previously, Lashkari Jangui, uh, which is considered as a splinter group of Sepoy, Sah uh, Sepoy Sahaba Pakistan, uh, is known to be the most uh, deadly uh, terrorist organization, also proscribed in, in the early uh, 2000 by the uh, by the Pakistani government and the U.S. has claimed 
uh, uh, at least 43% of the attacks against the Hazaras. Of course, as you could see uh, in the screen, uh, nearly half of the uh, perpetrators' uh, uh, attacks against the Hazaras remain unclaimed. But there are also shadow organizations such as Jaishul Islam, Jaishul Adil, that they have also claimed for, uh, uh, for some of the responsibilities against the Hazaras. Ahl Sunnat, uh, which is widely believed to be uh, to be the political face of Lashkari Jangui, it does not only provide the local support and legitimacy to the Lashkari Jangui, but it but it also backs uh, the uh, the. Uh, the violence of uh, Lashkar Jangui against the Hazaras in the mainstream politics of Pakistan. ISKP is also important because because ISKP uh, uh, ISKP is a surging threat. Uh, in in the most recent attacks, as you will further read in the chronology of the attacks, uh, uh, at least five recent attacks have been claimed by ISKP. And ISKP uh, the, the threat of ISKP also remains imminent. Um, against the Hazaras uh, of Afghanistan, uh, at least since its inception in uh, 2015. Uh, a report by the International Crisis Group, it, 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 it reveals that the food soldiers of Lashkari Jangui and the other shadow organizations have also, uh, have also joined uh, ISKP. Uh, and that, uh, therefore, uh, makes ISKP even more deadlier. Uh, next, Bismillah. Thank you. Um, as I um, earlier alluded, framing and analysis is very important. Now, one of the reasons why we did um, this study was um, the problematic framing and analysis of the previous reports. So what is wrong with the previous framings? First of all, um, there are three uh, dominant and common framings that have been used in the previous reports, persecution, ethnic cleansing, and sectarian violence. The problem with these three is um, at one level, um, definitional ambiguity. Uh, there is no particular widely accepted um, definition for um, the concept of persecution, and the United Nations itself is acknowledging that. Uh, but then at the same time, Persecution encompasses a wide um, array of, um, of violence, including verbal violence, but then at the other end of this uh, spectrum could be even genocide. Um, ethnic cleansing is the same because it's a very, very um, uh, loosely defined um, concept. Same as sectarian violence. Uh, another issue is that these framings do not capture all of the dimensions of these attacks. But then what captures all of the dimensions of these attacks? Because our findings show that the dimensions of these attacks go beyond persecution, beyond ethnic cleansing, and much more beyond ethnic uh, sectarian violence. Now, we think that two concepts, uh, namely genocide and crimes against humanity, better capture the wider aspects and wider dimensions of these attacks. Why is genocide important? Because genocide and the concept of genocide widely and more broadly captures membership of victims within an ethnic and religious group. And that's very, very important. That's at the core of the uh, systematic violence against the Hazaras. But then genocide also captures the intention and the consequences because genocide uh, basically deals with the destruction of a society, the destruction of an ethnic um, and, and religious uh, uh, community or group. This is of course a very broad uh, definition of genocide, but then it's because um, the concept of genocide captures these aspects that the concept of genocide is very relevant and pertinent. The crimes against humanity concept captures the civilian identity of the victims, both as individuals uh, who are targeted in these attacks, but also as a collective, a community that is uh, in a way criminalized, a community that is being targeted. Uh, so that's why we think that most of these attacks can be explained by the concept of genocide, can be framed as genocidal, but also 
there are some of these attacks that can be framed as crimes against humanity. Now, why is this important? I think for two reasons. First of all, um, these concepts and framings help us um, uh, get a deeper and more accurate understanding of the situation on the ground, of what is happening to the Hazaras. Um, but secondly, in terms of actions to be taken to avoid and to stop and to um, um, the consequences of these attacks, it's also important because the actions to be taken to, uh, to avoid persecution and to remedy the consequence of persecution will be um, fundamentally and diametrically different than those uh, actions that need to be taken and the urgency of, uh, of, these of these actions, of course, to be taken to stop a genocide or to stop crimes against humanity and to remedy the, um, uh, the consequences of genocide and crimes against humanity. So that's why the, um, a correct framing and a correct analysis is um, very much critical, vital, and important. Over to you, my son. Uh, to explain the response of the uh, government of Pakistan in the face of sustained violence against uh, Hazaras in Kuwaita and beyond, um, here I will briefly highlight one knee jerk responses before 2014, two, um, a national action plan, simply NAP, a multi sectoral approach to curbing uh, terrorist outfits between. Uh, that was designed to uh, uh, to curb terrorist outfits between uh, 2014 and 2021, and it's revised version post 2021 that basically underscores kinetic and non kinetic domains. Uh, first and foremost, the state response had been largely limited to knee jerk until 2014, such as the government issuing condemnation and condolence messages in the aftermath of a targeted attack, and with and with a highly politicized literature and mostly cliche and soulless messages. For example, when Imran Khan and his Pakistan's Pakistan Tehrik Insaf political party was in the position before 2018, Imran Khan and, and other key PTI leaders would directly acknowledge the ethnicity of the victims as Hazaras as they conveyed their messages, uh, let's say on social media. But when his party had formed the government after winning the 2018 elections, this literature shied away from acknowledging the ethnicity of the victims and survivors of Hazar killings. Moreover, um, on some occasions, the government and the opposition leaders visited victims' families, survivors, and community leaders, the former only when the community demanded these visits, mostly in and through hunger strikes, uh, dozens of peaceful citizens and protests. On occasions when uh, they succeeded to pay a uh, visit to the community, these politicians more often made promises over and over again to bring perpetrators of attacks to justice and ensure better protection for the hazards. On pragmatic levels, however, little was done to protect the, both, both to protect the uh, uh, community and punish the perpetrators of attacks against the Hazaras. Um, second, in, in 2014, the government of Pakistan announced the execution of a 20-point national uh, action plan, simply NAP, to curb terrorism by eliminating terrorist outfits across the country. Nonetheless, NAP proved effective in the later years as the Pakistani law enforcement agencies killed some of the key uh, LEJ leaders, mainly in Balochistan, under the pretext of uh, pol uh, police encounters or extrajudicial ju killings. And somehow, briefly clamped down on the group's hideouts. As a matter of fact, attacks against Quetta's Hazaras decreased in the subsequent years. Nevertheless, as this study shows, groups like Lashkari Jangawi or ISKP have not been rooted out altogether. In other words, the threat of terrorism is still out there and remains imminent. NAP has delivered little in terms of dismantling uh, the uh, financial networks of these groups and bringing their members to justice. The Pakistani state has done very little towards de-radicalization, addressing the acute wave of hate speech against Hazaras and tackling various other forms of discrimination and verbal persecution within its institutions and in the society more broadly. However, some practical actions were taken under NAP. One, the government de deployed permanent FC troops at the entry exit 
points of the Hazara enclaves, as was illustrated in the previous map, as Bismillah showed. Tain checkpoints, uh, checkpoints uh, uh, are installed around Hazara town and six around Mariabad. The government also provides security escorts to Hazara pilgrims visiting Iran and to shopkeepers visiting vegetable markets, um, as well as normally steps up uh, security measures around religious events such as uh, such as the Muharram processions. However, these measures have have come at the cost of further ghettoization of the Hazara community within 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 the two enclaves, and has adversely shrunk their mobility and hindered their socio uh, economic development. Uh, most Hazaras see the installation of permanent checkpoints around the enclaves as effective because non-Hazaras uh, and their vehicles are regularly checked when entering Hazara areas. And in some events, threats against the community were thwarted by uh, FC personnel installed at these checkpoints. However, some Hazaras have accused the FC personnel of harassing or intimidating members of the community, including women, at these checkpoints. Few have also accused them of collaborating with terrorist groups, such as the Lashkari Jangui. This is, well, um, not far from the truth, because in one event, uh, the key leaders of uh, uh, Lashkar Jangui's Balochistan unit clandestinely escaped from one of the most highly protected and tight terrorist jail in Quetta. Moreover, some studies have shown that NAP taken as a whole has been less effective because it lacked, um, among other things, a bottom-up approach. As far as the hazards of Quetta are concerned, the community was, was not consulted and the reports were not sought in the design or implementation of the NAP, neither the revised one, as I said, post-2014. General, general, okay, I think some parts of the general appraisal I, I did uh, cover, but uh, as to the figure figure two, I will explain a few points. The, the, the figure two actually shows the decrease of the attacks post uh, 2014 when the national action plan was devised and then implemented until 2021. Now, Two major reasons for the uh, downturn of attacks should be understood. Um, one, uh, before uh, 2014, the Pakistani government didn't have a devised and comprehensive counterterrorism uh, strategy to curb terrorism by dismantling and disarming terrorist outfits in the country. Of course, thanks to the 20-point uh, NAP uh, that somehow filled uh, this gap. But it... Uh, but of course, it had also other reservations, as I pre previously mentioned. And to the widespread protests and demonstrations by the Hazara community in Pakistan and across the world, which were held at different intervals, um, and where Hazara women played a decisive role. Um, I will stop here. Bismillah, please go ahead. Now, the consequences. As we said, uh, previous reports have uh, done little to capture the broad spectrum of uh, consequences that these attacks have left on the community. These consequences go far wide and deep um, at personal level, at family level, at um, community level. Um, we will, uh, I will just try to you know, condense um, our findings of the consequence of these attacks in this one slide. But of course, this is much uh, um, detailed in the report itself. One of the consequences of these attacks on the community has been gateweization of the community. Uh, the community has been isolated from the rest of Koita. Um, and as the previous slides also showed, um, you know, the movement and mobility um, of the members of the community um, outside this gateweization, uh, these ghettos, uh, has been uh, strictly um, limited over the years particularly around 2012 and 13, when these attacks were um, at their peak. It has also resulted in identity issues. Some members of the community uh, told us during the data collection that they had to disguise um, in order to, um, you know, to show as Uzbek, to show as Baluch sometimes, um, to escape um, the harms and, and, and the threat that would come uh, their way. Uh, if they were identified as Hazaras. Um, some of them sometimes um, avoided doing their prayers publicly in the places where they thought it was not safe. Uh, but it's also um, limited the inter-ethnic and interfaith relations um, in that particular part of Balochistan. 
And as a result, the Hazaras have been isolated so much um, uh, from the community and so much uh, preoccupied uh, within um, their within the boundaries of their, their ghettos. But the consequences have also been in terms of like psychological implications and mental health tools. Uh, one of the uh, studies by uh, which was published by Cambridge Medicine Journal in 2020 found that 68.2% of the participants were PTSD positive and 51.7% of the um, uh, participants were depression positive. And even within this, there is a huge gender disparity as well, meaning that women are disproportionately affected uh, by this. Um, experts also told us that there is widespread permeating um, levels of anxiety, paranoia, lack of motivation, and many other psychological and mental health uh, disorders among the members of the community. Uh, these attacks have also limited um, members, um, access of the members of the community to essential public services, which is very limited anyways. Their access to schools, to universities, to health facilities have also shrunk because most of these schools and universities and health facilities are located outside their ghettos and because their mobility is restricted, because their um, commute between their ghettos and these places uh, should traverse through uh, places that are called no-go zones for the Hazaras uh, because of the high um, threat, security threats. Um, these um, have made it very extremely difficult for the community to access uh, these uh, uh, services and facilities. It has also limited their employment prospects and their growth uh, because in cases, employers fear inviting risks by uh, employing Hazaras. Uh, in other cases, their mobility, as said earlier, is exacerbated. And there's a widespread discrimination at cultural level as well against the Shia Hazaras. Limitations on economic activities and livelihood can be another. Uh, businesses have been shut down and so many businesses belonging to the Hazara community had to move from outside uh, the, the ghettos to inside the ghettos. Uh, and they have been very much limited. And in other cases, breadwinners of families were killed in these attacks and families as a result of these attacks have been uh, very tragically impoverished because uh, of losing and as a result of actually losing their breadwinners. This has led to um, a high rate of outbound migration, which has very much increased over the past two decades. A very um, rough calculation based on the findings of this report shows that 25% of the entire population of the community has, over the past two decades, has moved outside the community or has migrated. Uh, to other cities within Pakistan in search of access to better um, employment prospects, um, better education and higher education and those things, but also safety and also um, to foreign countries, including um, Australia, New Zealand, um, the EU, the UK and North America, including the United States and Canada. Uh, an estimated 80,000 of them uh, moved to other cities uh, in, in, in Pakistan and 40 to 70,000 estimatedly uh, migrated outside the country. Uh, another very tragic consequences of these attacks is an increase in the rate of drug addiction within the community. Since 2011, particularly, uh, the drugs that are being commonly used is crystal meth, hashish, heroin, and others. And experts who are working in this sector told us that an estimated 10,000 um, members of the community are addicted to drug, to various drugs. And this is huge, given the, uh, given the fact that the entire population of the, the uh, community 
is no more than like 600,000. Uh, there are at least six local rehabilitation, rehabilitation centers, some of them government, some of them are not, but the capacities and capabilities of these um, um, local rehabilitation centers is extremely limited. Uh, just a reminder, Bismillah and Deltok, if you could please um, continue. Just then, your... only the recommendations. Thank you. Yeah. Th thank you for the reminder, uh, Anis John. I, I will take this reminder very seriously and, 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 and skip this slide. Um, I, I'm sure Bismillah will agree with me. <laughs> uh, will agree with me on that. Uh, just to allow uh, the readers and participants here to, uh, to, to read the recommendations as we have posed to uh, you know, specific actions to uh, to the local, uh, uh, national, and international actors and stakeholders. We very much, uh, uh, you know, thank you for your participation and your patience for listening to us. Uh, uh, we look forward uh, to our distinguished uh, speakers and, of course, to uh, the participants in this room uh, as they pose their questions to us in the Q and A session. Uh, over to you, Anis John. Thank you, um, Mr. Iltov and uh, Mr. Elizada for this uh, nuanced and detailed presentation. I must say that this um, research report is one of the most detailed and comprehensive studies that I have read so far. And I would like to encourage everyone to read the report and engage with its findings and recommendations. A reminder that we are going to have a Q&A, as um, Iltov mentioned. Uh, I, would like, I would like to encourage you uh, to uh, write your questions in the chat box, or alternatively, you can raise your questions yourselves. Um, in this uh, section of the um, the event, we will uh, proceed with the with our uh, guest speakers. Uh, we will have our um, uh, guest speakers um, to share their comments about the report. The first question that I would like to ask uh, from our um, uh, panel members is how they uh, how have they evaluated the report and what all its key strengths. Um, can we start with uh, Dr. Farhonda, please? Uh, Dr. Farhonda, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Anis John. Can you hear me? We can hear you, yes. Um, thank you, Anis John, for the um, uh, opening uh, the, the webinar and the authors for the really uh, detailed comprehensive report and then the presentation tonight I also like to thank uh, Pursish uh, Policy and Research Institute for organizing this and also for um, providing the platform for, for, for this report to take place. Um, I also uh, want to once again um, uh, echo what you just mentioned, Anis John, that this is one of the most uh, comprehensive, rare and important study and um, uh, that we have uh, we have uh, had uh, on the on this on this topic about the targeted and systematic killings of the Hazaras in Pakistan and um, nothing as such has been done on Afghanistan and there has been but not to this to this extent so I really like to congratulate the author especially considering that they have done this um, through their personal limited personal resources and also um, engaging uh, so deeply with such a, um, a heartbreaking and agonizing difficult topic for us um, it's a it's a collective achievement Achievement and I um, and I, I really like to um, uh, to uh, uh, praise uh, your work, uh, your very hard work. Um, regarding your question, Anis John, that what I would like to highlight about the strength of this report, there are many. Uh, as firstly, this is filling a gap. Uh, Hazaras is a uh, ethnically as a vulnerable ethnic group uh, in Afghanistan and then in Pakistan. Um, uh, we have given so much blood, but we have not seen uh, a lot of work being done or, or a lot of debate, a lot of scholarly um, uh, contribution uh, to make sense of this insanity, of this violence, of these systematic killings. Um, therefore, uh, the contribute, uh, contribution that these reports make um, is, is, is huge uh, for all of us. Um, and also uh, another strength of the report is that um, uh, it, it covers many aspects. Uh, it's not just coming from a human rights organization, for example, or a national action plan from a state. 
um, it, it, it engages all different actors, all different aspects of making sense of what is happening to the Hazara community in, in Pakistan and their vulnerability, the invisibility uh, that has been, um, that is in place and the, the, the nature of the attack, the typology of the, of the violence that has been going on, the different consequences that it, it has been having. It's a long report, but it, it's also short to cover um, everything um, that needs to be told and, and, and portrayed uh, in regards to the, to the Hazara community. So I think um, there are, uh, for me, I think the, the author themselves really um, highlighted uh, so much uh, characteristics about the report that I do not want to repeat uh, for the sake of the time. Um, it has done a brilliant job, especially providing historical context um, collecting, um, as they mentioned, secondary and primary data, making 80 plus interviews, uh, that, that is huge considering uh, how, how they have been able to do this within the short period of time. I think it was eight, um, eight plus months to do so. Um, interviews with members of the community um, uh, in, in all layers, um, uh, in, in, uh, generally um, divers, different age groups, um, uh, all of this give us um, uh, and paints a picture uh, about, about uh, the complexities of the situation, the uncertainty um, of the situation and, and making us or helping us to make sense and also the contribution that it makes in terms of accountability for the perpetrators. It engages very deeply um, with um, uh, who has been charged, uh, actors involved, what percentage from existing data who have been engaged in, uh, who have uh, uh, conducted uh, these crimes and what the state responses um, uh, that has taken place so far. Uh, but whatever that has not, this report has not been able to speak to also tells us about the, gap, the existing gaps that needs to be done from people beyond this and, and from now on that, that we could use this report as a reference point, as a base. I'm sure other speakers will also speak to this. Um, so I think um, overall, uh, these are the, there are many, many, many strengths. Um, nothing like which we have seen so far is, is the number one and, and, and its comprehensiveness. And it's also um, uh, try to tackle all sorts of complexities from politics, from power, um, different actor consequences on the community, on women, on men, and also on communi communal identity um, overall. Um, I have more to add. Uh, I think I'll just stop here, let other speakers to speak, but uh, please uh, allow me to speak later if I have time to um, uh, address some other aspect that I think the report could benefit more if it had addressed and also maybe potential um, research topic for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Farfonda. We will uh, uh, allow time for uh, for the discussion. Uh, we will move uh, to Dr. Um, Ali Karimi, if you could please um, answer the same question in your opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anis John, and thank you, Bismillah John, and my son John for the report. This is a huge achievement, especially coming uh, from two independent researchers, because there's no large institutional support behind it. There's no university behind it. It is an initiative by these two very capable researchers who go to the field and produce this uh, very comprehensive study, not only about the persecution of the Hazaras, but also about the city of Quetta and the Hazara ghettos in this city. Uh, usually border towns are very interesting. They are very diverse, they are volatile, and Quetta especially, this was the most remote outpost of the British Empire and has a very colorful history. And Hazaras contributed to the history of Quetta a lot since the 19th century, before the Abdul Rahman's uh, genocide, uh, the Hazaras would go to Quetta to work in the mines and also work on the railway. So they're 
were some connections between the Hazaras of Afghanistan and this border town in British Empire. And this relationship grew after the genocide. So I have a couple of points here uh, I want to make. Uh, and then if there were further questions, uh, I, I would be happy to, to address. One is that the strength and the importance of this report comes from the fact that it documents a very neglected violence that's going on in Pakistan against the Hazaras. Uh, documentation is very important. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, when Hazaras were commemorating the Afshar massacre, Hafiz Mansour, a top Jamiat member from uh, 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 Jamiat party, uh, he basically said that Afshar never happened. The massacre never happened. This is a fake story. Jamiat was uh, responsible for the mass killing in, in Afshar. So Afshar happened in 1993. Uh, people involved in the attack and also the survivors are still alive. And we have people who are denying it ever happened. So the same is true with many other systematic atrocities that happen against the Hazaras. If we don't document it, there are no others who would document it. And human memory is very, very unreliable. We, we will forget these documentations are evidence for future historians, for future generations to, to learn about what was going on in this period of time in Pakistan. So this is a very historical achievement in my view. And uh, especially that it is not only just a list of uh, uh, attacks, although very important, but it also offers information about the context, the political, social, and economic context of these atrocities. One thing that I personally learned was the existence of the Sunni Hazaras in Kuwait. I didn't know, I thought that uh, Kuwait was mostly Shia Hazaras. An interesting thing about the Sunni Hazaras, as mentioned in the report, is that they don't live in the ghetto. They live with the rest of the society in Kuwait with the Sunnis, and they face little um, attacks from their neighbors. This is uh, interesting because I see a similar pattern in Kabul. In the 18th century, when the Kizilbash from Iran moved to Kabul, they built this walled city inside the city, Chindawul. Chindawul was basically a walled city. Nobody could go inside. The reason was that the, there was a lot of sectarian violence. The Sunnis would attack the Shia households. So they, have, they had to build this neighborhood and build a wall around it. Among the Kizilbash who, who came to Kabul, there were also Sunni Kizilbash. The Turks were mostly Shia, the Kurds were uh, Sunni. But the Sunnis did not face this kind of violence. They lived freely among other Sunni uh, population in Kabul. And one group that uh, came to mind is the Rika. Rika is a Kurdish tribe. And in old Kabul, there is an area called Rika Khwana. And uh, the same is happening right now in Kuwaita. The, the, both groups are Hazara, but the Shia ones have to live in a ghetto, but the Sunni ones are free uh, to live with the rest of the society, which shows how much religion, how much uh, uh, sectarian violence affect the shape of the city, the form of the city. This ideological violence is not only ideological, but it's also very geographical. From the geography, you can learn a lot about the history of a city. And Quetta and Kabul and other divided cities offer good examples. Uh, there, there was one other point uh, that, yeah, uh, in the report, there, there is a very helpful typology about. Uh, what kind of attacks took place during this period from 1999 to 2022. 84% uh, of attacks are targeted shootings. These are sometimes um, targeted, like they attack a prominent member of the Hazara community in Kuwait, a teacher or a doctor. 
but most of them, from what I understand, is just random. A Hazara is walking on the street and suddenly somebody sh shoot them. Or a Hazara is driving in a rickshaw or in a taxi and they are attacked. Just because they are Hazara, there is no any homework behind it. Like, oh, let's um, identify a prominent member of the Hazara community and then attack them. No, it is just a random act of violence. Uh, and it comes from the very fact that the victims are Hazaras and that's it. But there is some explanation that probably could help us understand uh, why the scale of targeted shootings are so, so, so high. And, um, and that is something that the authors beautifully mention uh, and explain in the report. And that is the ecosystem of hate in Pakistan that uh, is built up on this network of uh, radical madrasas. They keep producing this hateful, uh, hateful ideology that depicts the Shias as infidels. And um, in one case, at least in Hakkaniya Madrasa, this is the most radical Sunni Madrasa in Pakistan, mostly based in Khaybar Pashtun Khan. According to a forthcoming book that will be published hopefully next year, a graduate of the Hakkani Madrasa explains that how when you graduate from this school, um, there is a condition, a requirement for graduation, and that is killing a Shia. So when a, in other university, when a student graduates, they write a thesis, but for Hakkani Madrasa, you have to kill a Shia. So usually these students, before graduation, they get on a car and drive for 12 hours to Kuwaita and find that random Hazara, a single person or a family of Hazaras, and just kill them. And that helps them to graduate from the Hakkani uh, Madrasa because uh, they, uh, they see this, the existence and the sustainability of hate as part of their own sustainability. If they want to survive, they have to keep up the hate in Pakistan. Uh, I, I've only visited Pakistan once, but from what I know, um, you can walk into any random bookstore in any city in Pakistan, you can find stacks of books that are written by this clergy, uh, radical clergy, uh, arguing that the Shias are infidel. So that kind of systematic widespread hate is the reason that the Shias everywhere, especially in Pakistan, are under attack. And there is little change from the uh, uh, Pakistan establishment. There are some very helpful concrete um, recommendation at the end of the report. And also it is mentioned that something should be done about this ecosystem of hate, this uh, anti-Shia um, pedagogy that uh, is such an integral part of the uh, Pakistani education system, Pakistani religious education system. So mm -hmm. if there is a way out, it should be more uh, fundamental, it should be more institutional than this uh, quick fixes, like putting up checkpoints here and there. That's not gonna reduce uh, the level of violence uh, mm -hmm. and it's not going to save any Hazara lives. Thank you very Thank much. You. Again, Thank you, Dr. Karimi. Thank you so much, Dr. Karimi. Um, can we have Dr. Melissa for the same question, uh, please? Dr. Melissa, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hi, yes, thank you very much um, for inviting me. And I, I just want to, to third um, the congratulations because it's such an impressive a report, and I, I mean, I can repeat all the same things. It's really filling in gaps that that need to be filled. I, I just want to take a, a moment, really a quick moment, to say, you know, when I was in the field in Bamiyan, um, in in that time period, um, there was the attack in Quetta on February sixteenth, twenty thirteen, and um, so the civil society activists that that I was um, doing research with in Bamiyan devoted a lot of attention at that point in time uh, to memorializing the attack and then to uh, camping out uh, outside of Yunama and actually holding a, a hunger strike 
that went on for a, a period of time. And so part of my understanding of uh, Hazara protest movements came from the, the response of, of, of the, the you know, people in Bamiyan to an attack in Quetta. And um, I mean, I'm not gonna out anyone, but I think one of the hunger strikers is actually in the audience. So that's also kind of bringing something full circle. Um, but it, it does show how uh, all of these issues are very much um, connected and so on and so forth. So I, I, I'll try to keep this um, pretty brief. I mean, I think a lot can be said about the rigorousness of this report. Um, you know, it, it goes into a lot of detail and it's clearly been checked and rechecked. But something that I was really impressed with as well was there is a lot of attention paid to the social side of things. Um, and and in, in many different instances, I noticed this. Um, and, and I think it gave it that kind of um, just really extra depth that I think makes it exceptionally strong. So, you know, from one thing that comes to the top of my head was a really um, thoughtful explanation about the interplay of religious identity and ethnic identity that places Hazara as a particular risk. I mean, I think this is something that we comment on again and again, but I think that there was kind of a, a real, again, kind of special effort to explain this in, in, in a particularly thoughtful way and to explain how this is then kind of enacted in, in the environment in Quetta. Um, you know, also I noticed, you know, so not only was there this kind of very rigorous listing of attacks, but there was an effort made to try to give attention to the meanings um, of the attacks. In some ways, uh, it was almost um, ethnographic. I know that sounds strange because I'm talking about an ethnography of, 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 of attacks, but um, I think this is something quite uh, important to try to understand the kind of social meaning, meaning that is not only be felt, being felt by the victims, but also the social meaning that perpetrators are giving to the attacks. And I felt like that was also coming through here. Um, in a lot of ways, that reminded me of some of the work that um, some really known, well-known anthropologists have done on uh, genocide. Um, I think Alexander Hinton comes to mind as someone who has really looked into, you know, the deep, deep meaning um, that that perpetrators give to what they are doing. And this isn't something that's very pleasant to study or pleasant to talk about, of course. But I think it is uh, important in in you know fully understanding what's happening and then. You know, hopefully finding a way to to counter it, and then you know, kind of along the same lines, um, the meaning to the attacks, but also kind of a, a very well fleshed out um, uh, portrayal of who the perpetrators are, you know, what their um, purpose might have been, how that might have changed over time, and, and then just you know, some of the the language and quotes and things like this that come out of them. This this also I thought was really, really important to include, particularly when you're trying to use the framework of genocide. You, you know, I felt like the authors were a little bit reticent, um, because they're not legal scholars, to um, you know, just really make that claim. Like, like this is genocide, so, we, so we're framing it in that way, but we're not legal scholars. But I think, you know, honestly, I think you could have gone a little bit further and, and, and said, you, you know, no, this is what it is. Like, here's the definition and, and, and here's what we're seeing happening here that's, that's in line with it. I don't think that you have to be a legal scholar to, to uh, do that. Um, but, but, but this was still, you know, just again, really, really um, great. I loved the way you guys positioned yourselves. I don't think I see that very often in this sort of reports, but you went to such great lengths to, uh, you know, describe who you are, and then also to, to, you know, kind of stake a claim and say this is why you're the right people to do this sort of report, and 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 I really liked that as well. Um, you, you know, you you owned up to being from the community, and you said that is why 
this report is going to be very strong because we're going to have like a rapport and we're going to have a connection that that other people are not going to have. And, um, you know, that's absolutely true. And so just, you know, positioning yourself in that way, I think is also very important. You guys could tell I'm, I'm reading this as an anthropologist. Um, and then kind of the, the last point, and I know this has kind of been touched on, but um, or maybe this will be my second to last point, right? I mean, the also referring back to the social impacts, I mean, just, just to see the many, many ways that the society has been affected was was incredible. It must have taken so much work to try to not just, you know, look at victims and kind of, you know, give us the stories of the victims, but to look at the impact it's had on education and people's access to education, to look on the impact it's had on business and people's access to business, to look on it, the impact it's had on uh, the use of narcotics and of course the mental health of the community and, and to have all these things. And then to have it done in such a, um, you know, um, a sensitive way with respect to gender and looking at gender differences and, and so on and so forth. Um, okay, so I'll say my last thing now. At the end, um, not the very, very end, but kind of the, the end of before the recommendations, you bring up um, this topic of resilience. And, you know, again, resilience is something that we have to be careful of, I think, when we're talking about vulnerable communities, right? Because, you know, uh, maybe we would like a world where people didn't have to be resilient, or maybe, you know, there are people from this community who, who aren't resilient, and that's perfectly understandable. Why should you have to be resilient in the face of all this? What about the people who just, you know, don't, like, don't recover? And that might be some people's story. But I thought that you, you know, did a very good job of just, you know, including this um, kind of, uh, strength of the community at the very end while allowing for the fact that you know this isn't the only way this isn't the you know this isn't the story of every Hazara and Quetta maybe not everybody is resilient but but some people are and so let's you know take a moment and let's acknowledge that and so I also thought that that was um really well done so I'll close there but like it's an amazing report and, and I am really honored that I got the chance to, to comment on it. So thank you very much for that. Thank you, Dr. Melissa. We really do appreciate your contribution as well to our collective understanding of the Hazara situation. We're going to circle back to um, Dr. Akbari. Um, Dr. Akbari is going to raise some, issues, some, some points. Um, I also have a question, if you could cover that as well, please. Uh, one of the, uh, an extremely understudied aspect of the ongoing genocidal uh, attacks on the Hazaras is the differential and disproportionate impact uh, on the Hazara woman. This is mainly due to the existing gender power dynamics within uh, the society. Uh, do you feel that this report has sufficiently addressed the gendered aspects of the violence and why is this important? Thank you, Dr. Falconda. The floor is yours. Thank you, Anis John. A um, uh, couple of points on uh, what could have been done to strengthen and also uh, I will cover um, your question on gender. I think I would just uh, like to go back to what Dr. Melissa mentioned about uh, author's engagement with the concept of genocide. I also think, um, I agree with Dr. Melissa, that there was a scope in the report um, for the authors to engage much more deeply with the concept of genocide. And also, um, they, they did sort of at the beginning, sort of introducing the concept and talking about it, but it could have been um, analyzed and evaluated much more with the lived experiences that they have shared and then the the, the data that they have shared throughout the report and needed uh, with with the with the with the definition of genocide I think it could have strengthened the report a lot more um, uh, beyond uh, I mean it's already a great report but also sort of uh, it, it's it's more of like a like a technical thing that could have been done um, knowing the fact that uh, the authors have been very brave um, in their approach and also bringing this um, very heavy concept and also analyzing it, the definition, but uh, could have been a lot more, benefited a lot more 
by engaging with it much more deeply conceptually uh, with, uh, um, with experiences and examples. On your question, Anis John, about, about, about gender role and how much it has been, I mean, we have already um, sort of uh, touched uh, upon this, but I think um, the systematic uh, killings of the Hazaras, um, be, be it in Afghanistan or in Pakistan, uh, and the impacts on women have been have been silent. It have been uh, invisible, um, a lot more than what we as a community overall have experienced. I mean, as a woman, there's another layer of vulnerability. There are a, a complexity of um, intersectionality of vulnerability that women experience in the community um, uh, by facing these kinds of violence. The report mentions that about, I think it was 17% of the victims of the attack were female and the remaining 83% of the victims were um, either fathers, husbands, and brother. Uh, they have left that other 83% um, of the victims have left their responsibilities to women in the families. Um, they're the one who have to provide food on the table, feed the family, educate the children, and also um, um, uh, keep on uh, with their own um, sort of um, identities um, uh, in the community. Um, and also, contextualizing that these women are operating in a much in a very conservative patriarchal society like that of Pakistan or that of Afghanistan um, their vulnerability arises immensely in absence of uh, male members of their family um, uh, especially in the face of a security threat um, in, in additional that they have to go through the physical threats and the emotional hardship, isolation and discrimination that every member of the Hazara community go through. But there are a kind of gender-based discrimination, marginalization of women that are that they experience um, that are an additional sort of layer um, that we don't know much uh, and haven't been spoken about. And unfortunately, it was not covered um, comprehensively in the report, which it could have um, done so, knowing that the authors did have access to and did interview some of the uh, interviewees were, were female, a survival um, of family members of the, of the, of the victims. And um, some of the quote from the female member actually touch upon these complexities and, and, and intersectionalities of vulnerability. That in addition to the sort of the trauma that they go through, the ghettoization, the isolation, um, and the economic depravity, but they also go through um, a sexual harassment. They also go through um, um, uh, sort of uh, being labeled and, and, and much more mar marginalized from their in-laws um, because of, of, of their gender identity. Um, uh, there was a paper from Siddiqa Sultani and her colleagues, uh, I think it was published in December last year. Um, uh, she, she covered the experiences of Hazara women in Pakistan um, being a multi-layered minority, minority within the minority in her paper. And, and I think she was also one of the interviewees in this paper. And I think um, the paper could, uh, could do much more. It already does touch a lot more than what we see in such reports. But I think um, it could do a lot more, and and I think this is also a lessons, a learning lesson for for all of us that um, the way women experience violence is very different, is acknowledged by the authors, but then also um, giving it a space and time to sort of evaluate it more, and so that we know uh, much more um, about it. Another uh, aspect of the report um, that I wanted to quickly mention is that. It has a, a large um, number of interviewees from different from different um, groups, gender or or um, age group of or or um, sort of class or affiliations of the Hazara community. But I was also interested to hear what non Hazaras think about the situation of the Hazara community in Pakistan, which I did not really um, capture much. Um, um, there are official reports like the Human Rights One, the National Action Plan, or the political statement that the uh, statesmen make um, upon any of these attacks. 
but, uh, but I wonder if the author had the opportunity or could have seized an opportunity to speak to officials or even the Pakistani civil society, uh, influential bo bodies or persons from legal and judicial sectors about how they understood uh, this, um, this, this violence, targeted violence against the Hazara community to make sense of it. I think it's also important for us that we highlight uh, uh, what we go through, but also understand what others think of it in order to sort of um, understand the context much more and also help us more with our advocacy work in the future and um, steps forward in, 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 in implementing or um, realizing the recommendations that were met. Um, thank you, Anis John, sorry if I took long. Thank you, Dr. Farhuda, that's perfect. Uh, I wanted to ask two questions from uh, Dr. Melissa and Dr. Karimi. I think I'm going to skip those questions. Uh, we will open the floor to our um, audience to ask their questions. We have got a few questions um, uh, from our audience. The first question is uh, for the authors. Ehsan Darwish um, has raised this question, um, and it's a two-part question. It's saying that, um, has the data of the victims been collected based on the gender and age group? The second part is, what is your recommendations for related organizations? This is for uh, Mr. Iltof and Mr. Alizadeh. Uh, Anis John, thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, Bismillah also agree, uh, agrees with me. If you if you would please uh, do not skip the questions from Dr. Karimi and uh, Dr. Melissa. I think I think we will have some time on that. Maybe maybe you could just uh, you know uh, uh, deduct some time from the <clears throat> from the Q and A session. Uh, uh, I think I I think. Uh, uh, that that's very important because we have this opportunity and, and, and we have the participants. It would be we would be delighted to to hear uh, more. Perfect. Um, no no problem. I can go ahead and ask my question. So um, the first question um, I would like to ask from Dr. Karimi. Um, Dr. Karimi, uh, the local and national media, as the main source of information, have the important task of providing accurate information to the public. Unfortunately, the Pakistani media has consistently underreported or fail to provide the correct uh, number of casualties in these attacks, creating, this has created an information gap. To what extent do you think this report has addressed um, this deliberate information gap? Can we have uh, Dr. Karimi, please? Okay, thank you very much. I will be brief. Uh, this report is going to help a lot of people, not only government agencies in Pakistan, but also people uh, here in, in the West, uh, because uh, there is an information gap when it comes to uh, literature of um, atrocities against the Hazara community in Pakistan. So if uh, we have uh, we have a lot of new Hazaras, who, uh, new arrivals from Hazara community who, uh, who are in the US and in Europe, and they have pending applications for asylum. So this report should be forwarded to their lawyers and immigration judges so to, to learn about the scale of the problem in Pakistan. So, um, because otherwise, if the lawyers uh, just Google and search New York Times or The Guardian, they can't find information. Even if they look into Pakistani media, they can't find accurate information about the violence against the Hazaras. So this is a very helpful report for that kind of needs. And uh, uh, there is another issue that I want to mention, and then uh, we can go uh, along with the Q and A. Uh, one question that we get a lot from non-Hazaras is that why you Hazaras keep complaining uh, about every little attack or big attack that happens? Attacks happen, violence happen a lot in Afghanistan. It is a common thing. First of all, it is not common. It is only the Hazaras who are targeted for their religion and for their ethnicity. Second, we never got a closure. The, uh, the genocide in the 19th century is still being denied by prominent Afghans. Uh, the Afshar massacre being denied by prominent politicians. So you don't get, when you don't get closure, when you don't get acknowledgement, apology, the wound stay fresh. So we have to, we have no other option. We have to raise our voice. We have to document this violence. And um, 
is struggle to be visible even if uh, there is no institutional support. This report is a good example of an initiative by individuals without any hope, without any support from anyone, any, gov any government. They just do it because this is right. Every community suffering from violence should do the same. Tajiks, Uzbeks right now in Afghanistan, they suffer from systematic killing and uh, land grab by the Taliban, but they are silent. That is not the right way to respond to uh, violence. And uh, there is, if there is one thing that others can learn from the Hazaras, this is that they should raise their voice and document these atrocities. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Karimi. Um, Dr. Melissa, the next question is for you. Uh, for you, um, Another important aspect of the ongoing uh, violence um, against Hazaras in Quetta is the enduring trauma experienced by the Hazaras collectively. How has this report um, engaged with the collective trauma and collective memory of uh, the violence? Dr. Melissa, if we can have your insights on this question, please. Thank you. Yeah, so, um... I was very impressed that the report dealt with trauma. To be perfectly honest, I, I didn't feel that it really got into the idea of kind of a collective trauma as, as a concept. I think we got little hints, right, that there was there is intergenerational trauma, especially in the life stories, right? We had the stories of several um, children who have lost parents who are talking about um, the, the trauma that they have felt. And then there was a section devoted kind of very specifically to trauma. Um, you know, collective trauma is, is, is something a little bit different and a little bit uh, more specific, right? It, 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 it deals with the, the entire group, right? And the feeling on, on, on the part of the entire group that, that they are um, under attack. So I, you know, I don't know that that um, was, dealt with head on, and, you know, I don't know that that necessarily is as much, <laughs> excuse me, I'm recovering from a cold, um, I, as, as, as much of a, of a drawback though as it, as it might have been, you know, because that's kind of a, a very particular um, social phenomenon that, you know, you wouldn't necessarily have to see in a report like that. Um, maybe just a little bit more attention on the, you um, the, the impact, uh, the kind of intergenerational uh, traumatic impact on, on, on the children of the victims. I, like, again, that was there, but I, I, I suppose it could have been stated kind of with, you know, much more clarity. Um, so, yeah, I guess my answer is in some ways it's there, in some ways it's not there. Um, I don't see that as, as, as a, a really glaring omission, though, because this is kind of a, a different type of report, if that makes sense. And um, uh, they're, they're, they might have highlighted a little bit more um, intergenerational trauma, but you know, overall, I think it's really great. Thank you so much, Dr. Melissa. We are going to open for a quick Q and A. Uh, we have got a few hands, um, a few questions um, as well as um, uh, our audience. They have raised their hands as well. I think we will um, give the floor to Jefferson. If I'm pronouncing your last name properly, I think. You're the first one who raised um, your hand, please. The floor is yours if, if you would like to ask your question. I I, th I cannot see. Um, I think Jefferson is not here. Um, we would like to go ahead with um, Dr. Arif Sahar. Uh, Dr. Sahar, the floor is, you for, is yours. Please um, do ask your question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anijan. Um, first of all, I'd like to congratulate and acknowledge you, Bismillah and uh, my son uh, for producing such an excellent and timely report. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to reading the report. So I've had the privilege to read it, yeah. But uh, based on the presentation, also the, uh, the discussions that we have had from the reviewers. Uh, so I've got uh, a couple of uh, little suggestions and then a question. Uh, so if I've understood properly, uh, please, Bismillah and uh, Maisam, uh, feel free to correct me if I've got it wrong. So there are uh, five uh, uh, keywords, persecution, ethnic cleansing, uh, sectarian violence, genocide, and crimes against humanity. Uh, 
if if I've understood it properly uh, from your presentation, so uh, you guys are trying to replace uh, presentation, uh, sorry, persecution, ethnicizing, and sectarian violence with the terms genocide and uh, crimes against humanity uh, in your report. Have I got it right? Um, well, Dr. Asif, um, first of all, thank you so much for um, taking time and participating. Um, well, first of all, no, it's not that we uh, try to replace those uh, framings and concepts with the other framings. Um, our claim is basically we argue that our findings, like what the finding of our studies show, cannot be captured by the concept of persecution. It cannot be captured by the concept of ethnic cleansing. It cannot be captured by um, um, sectarian violence fully. That's those um, concepts are extremely limited in terms of capturing the entirety um, of, of, of what has been done to the uh, Hazara community in Pakistan. And we think that there is a, like a better sort of like um, capacity, uh, conceptual capacity in the concept of genocide and the concept of crimes against humanity to capture these more fully. Uh, right, thank you. Because uh, what I understand from the violence inflicted against the Hazara community across Pakistan, uh, so uh, it is so complex, multifactorial, multi uh, faceted, and then obviously multi sectoral. So it would be quite naive to deduct the fact that persecution, ethnicalizing, and sectoral violence, they all apply to the case uh, of the Hazara communities. Uh, perhaps one suggestion would be that instead of saying that these other teams, these other theories do not capture the experience and the perceptions, so it would be better framed if we said like this. So in addition to the theories in relation to the persecution of the Hazaras, ethnic cleansing and also sectarian violence, it is a good idea to add lit literature from, from the genocidal and also the crimes against humanities. Uh, so I think it is just a matter of, uh, uh, a matter of framing uh, because the, the violence that the Hazara communities have endured over the past, I don't know how many decades, uh, it spans across all those territories and all those frontiers. So I'm sure that that would be quite naive to, to not uh, kind of pay attention uh, to those. And also the other thing is uh, since uh, the, the violence against the Hazaras uh, has got multiple dimensions and dynamics. And these dimensions and dynamics could be defined at the national, regional, and international levels. Again, in order to, uh, to explain the, the experience and also the perceptions of violence against the Hazaras uh, in a more comprehensive term. So it is always uh, quite important to bear all these uh, theories in mind. Uh, the other thing is perhaps um, when we talk about these genocides and crimes against humanities, uh, I'm sure your research shows that there are many actors behind it. Uh, I don't know in terms of the ethics uh, of the research and also in terms of the political implications uh, of the findings. Have you managed to uh, kind of think about safeguarding the relationship between the Hazara communities and the state itself? Uh, which is uh, uh, to be blamed for most, for most, at least for a good chunk of the violence inflicted against the Hazara communities. We understand that the the efforts and the the, the efforts and contributions that we are trying to make uh, uh, to the struggles of the Hazara communities to reach peace with justice in Pakistan. So we have got to be quite careful not to put them. Uh, uh, in a place where, where it makes it more difficult for them to make uh, uh, meaningful uh, relationships and also engagement with the broader society. I don't know whether you have had a talk about that in uh, terms of the Dr. ethics. Of in the interest not. of time, I'm very sorry to cut you off. Um, we are the last question, Anna so this, this is the question. Now, see, in terms of the reasons why the Hazar communities are being persecuted in Pakistan, uh, do you know any concrete reasons from the from the communities themselves. I know you have captured their experiences, but have you managed to capture their perceptions of the violence uh, and also the factors behind this violence as well? Thank you. Uh, Anna John, apologies for going quite long. Thank you so much, Dr. Saib. Um, Bismillah John, would you like to take that question? Thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Saib, for all of the um, 
the comments and the questions. Well, in fact, uh, yes, we also agree with the fact and um, our general approach um, in that particular part of the report is that um, we cannot claim that all of these attacks are genocide or all of these attacks are crimes against humanity. Some of them and quite like quite a lot of them are uh, cases of genocide, but there are like many that are not. So our stance is basically that, you know, when we limit and when the other reports have limited to persecution, they have not gone beyond that. Those uh, particular frames cannot encompass all of the uh, dimensions and all of the attacks. Uh, so that's one. Uh, yes, we have uh, captured the uh, Hazara state relation, the relationship between the Hazara community and the state uh, in the report to, to some extent. And we've also looked actually at how the community itself perceives um, the attacks and why, um, you know, and, and, and that question of why and how the community answers that question of why to themselves. Uh, yes, that is like um, to, to a great extent that is reflected in the report. Thank you, uh, Bismillah. We have got Dr. Nazif Shahroni with us. Um, Dr. Sab, the floor is yours. Please ask your question. Thank you so much. Banaam Khodawandi Jan Khrab. Salam ba amegi bininda wa dostay aziz. It was a, a fascinating and very competent report prepared by two, two young Hazara scholars, as they have self-identified. I have not read yet the uh, report i've just heard it and heard it to be extremely competent i uh, again congratulate the reporters as well as those who commented on, on them however i do have some uh, warnings and the warning is um, is native scholars especially young scholars there are risks for um acceptance native scholars always have a challenge and challenge is believability um, we have essentially three very important tasks one is documentation ethnographically which you have done so competently the second part is analysis and the last is evaluative the problem in this report, or the risk of it anyway, to me so far, seem to be that evaluative part, especially using the concept of genocide, which has become so common in, by anyone, anywhere. The genocide needs to be documented first in terms of intention of those who perpetrate the crimes. Have you talked to any of those who have been mentioned as possible perpetrators? If it is Haqqani uh, Madrasa in its um, uh, particular you know, graduation condition, have you talked to any of them to see whether the intention, in fact, in those who committed is genocidal? whether the local community you studied also themselves mentioned this is something they perceive to be genocidal and then you can go outside to others sometimes characterization of analysis can be in fact instead of uh, effective or um, um, Medical uh, good, the positive can be very risky and can jeopardize the value of the entire um, analysis, especially if the authors are natives. So I just want want you to uh, pay close attention to that. I would say the best thing is to do your um, documentation and your analysis. Leave the evaluative things, especially if your categories are evaluated, so leave them and let the reader essentially evaluate for themselves where, which um, characterization for them would explain what's going on. 
The other things that I wanted to mention is a very important point that was made, um, self-ghettoization of Hazaras and other minority communities, especially in big urban centers, and how that makes them easy target for those who rise against them. Then are there any recommendation for perhaps reconsidering whether ghettoization or self-contained communities are helpful for safety and security? Or is it a risk? As it has been in West, uh, Western Kabul, as it was for offshore, if it was for others. So it's very, very important to think about this. What is the implication of ghettoization and what should be done so that this problem of becoming an easy target can be resolved? My question really or sort of surprise was that we all think that about half a million Hazaras were dislocated to Quetta in the 19, 19, I mean 1890s. And the number you're giving us now is 600,000 in Quetta. What happened? Was the original estimates wrong? Or something else may explain why the Hazara community in Quetta has remained about the same as it was 115 years ago especially if there were some even before the coming of the, uh, you know, those who came in the 19th century. So those were, the, the, that question I think to me is something of a puzzle, but the rest is really just a commentary and, and highlighting a possible potential risk for native author, authors that we all are. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Say, for your very important comments. Um, uh, Bismillah or um, uh, El Tov, if uh, one of you would like to respond to Dr. Zeb's question, please. It's it's such a delight, uh, Dr. Uh, Shaharani, uh, to have you here. It's it's uh, we are we are so delighted. Uh, coming to your comments, um, um, I will leave the the native part to Bismillah to comment on that. But there are two things uh, that um, I think is perceived and uh, not correctly. One is the issue of self. Ghettoization. Hazaras in Quetta uh, are not self ghettoized. You know, before the 1980s and 1990s, Haz Hazara community in Quetta is a very vibrant community. It is, you know, uh, uh, they love uh, uh, what we have perceived and what I, as, 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 as a member of this community who have been raised here, have observed. Um, and, and, and what we have come across the uh, interviews that we had with, uh, with our interviewees, they had a very, uh, you know, vibrant and an incredible inter-ethnic and inter-religious uh, 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 connection with other uh, communities, including Punjabis, including Pashtuns, Baluchs, um, and, uh, and, and, and so on. So it's not self-ghettoization. Uh, uh, Hazaras have been forced to ghettoization. And this ghettoization, as you have rightly uh, mentioned, is one of the aspects that Hazaras uh, have, uh, that have left Hazaras vulnerable to these uh, you know, militant groups. Now, that is important because prior to the implementation of these check posts that, uh, that I mentioned uh, in my presentation, uh, the the area, the geographical layout that Hazaras are centered around there, that, that was completely, you know, open to any kind of threat. So that's why two major incidents in, in the early uh, uh, 2013 uh, were direct attacks within the enclaves, within the Hazara enclaves. These two attacks are so far the most deadliest attack uh, since that has occurred against the Hazara community uh, that has killed or injured uh, more than 500 people in only two attacks. So Hazaras, uh, in short, Hazaras 
just want to engage and interact with other communities, they, while still they are get-wise, they are still doing this. They are still trying to find ways to interact with communities, with other communities. But of course, there remains the risk, as uh, Bismillah said. Uh, let's take an example of this, this, this implication on, on, on the identity of Hazaras. Now, when they... Uh, when they when they go out of these enclaves, they hide and conceal their identities, not to be uh, you know not to be vulnerable to these threats. That's of course that's also another you know other th things are also come to play, very particularly the the facial features of Hazaras because they are so easily identified as Hazaras among other ethnic groups uh, in the in the in the in the city. This was about the self. Uh, Getwization, because because if it is uh, perceived as self getwization, the things that you mentioned, Doctor Saib, now they they will be very problematic to understand. Um, the the second thing, I, I I think I just lost that. It was about the, oh the yeah, number. the number, the number. Mm -hmm. uh, Doctor Saib, the number. Uh, I mean, that was so surprising to me. Our our archival research. Uh, the, the the research reports, the very reliable and important research reports that we have uh, studied in our literature review for this uh, for conducting uh, this study, not as not in any of them we have uh, we have come across that number. That's a very I think that's a very unrealistic uh, number. Uh, as so as you as you will see a, in the report, you have we have corrective. you have to give a corrective if there is a number that you have come across that's reasonable to you in the 18th century or 19th century please provide that in the report uh in the first chapter we have extensively looked into this and we have also provided a very uh, 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 a very important table that that lists the population of hazaras uh, uh, since 1920 uh, and before that, and 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 then the recent, the most recent number that that's six uh, six hundred thousand uh, uh, people as of the early uh, 20, uh, 2023. Uh, Bismillah, would you like to take that, or if if you would like to add to what I have just uh, let me mentioned. just mention self ghettoization of your repeated description, not mine. My issue really is self contained communities which tend to happen, just the rule of uh, migration, whether rural, urban, or otherwise, it happens throughout the world. And it becomes, uh, uh, when in times of violence and intense violence, it becomes an uh, easy target. That's what I'm referring to. And what needs to be done, if anything, or could be done. That's thank you all. so much. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Saib. Yes. Um, so in our case, we don't frame it as self gateways and we say gateways-ation um, um, simply. And um, in the recommendations part of the, uh, the report, we have recommended to um, both the um, um, state level government in Baluchistan and the national government of Pakistan to take measures to de um, That's That's one of the things that, uh, that, that Hazaras really need uh, to, to be de um, But yes, that's a, that's a very... Um, uh, long discussion to be had, um, and we uh, totally agree that self gateways is not the right way to or to live or to um, to really um, frame the situation of the Hazaras. In terms of um, intention, I would be very quick. Um, in terms of intention, uh, we have attached as one of the annexes to this report, we have attached a 2011 um, letter, threat letter by uh, Lashkar Jangvi, uh, in which even like the title of this report, we will make Pakistan their graveyard. Even the title is um, a sentence from that letter um, that was uh, circulated in Koita in August 2011, which was, uh, which is also uh, actually translated and then documented by Human Rights Watch. Um, the perception within the community is also something like that. Um, uh, and with regards to uh, the population of Hazaras in Pakistan. We went to the um, Balochistan archives. Unfortunately, there is not in a, a, like much um, evidence in the archives either. Uh, in, the, in 1921, the archives, um, there is something like 2,000 Hazaras in, in Balochistan, of course, which is very much underrated. And uh, I also personally think that the 500,000 would be too much inflated, but um, our estimation based on the reasoning that we provide in the report in chapter one is 
that in 1920 or 1921, around that time, should have been between 10 to 15,000 Hazaras in Kuita. And um, in 1950s, around that time, should have been between 15 to 25,000 uh, Hazaras in Kuita. We have figures from the 1970s onwards, um, official figures and figures from the community itself, um, beginning from 40,000 um, and, and, and on onwards. Uh, yeah, um, I won't take too long. Maybe um, let's take yeah. more questions. Sure, thank you so much. Um, and it's John, before you move to the next question, uh, can I very briefly, very quickly touch uh, two, two important things here uh, so that the, the picture is more clear. Uh, to Dr. Saib and, of course, to our participants here. Uh, Bismillah, just a, a, a very quick correction. In, in 1921, uh, Dr. Saib, based on the official reports of the of the of the uh, uh, British India, then uh, it provides uh, 4,004. It is 4,004 is the specific record that is being recorded. I mean, that's the specific figure that's being recorded in the statistical review of uh, statistical uh, statistical document of the British India then and then in 1951 the record uh stretches to uh, 7420 and this is also uh, uh and this also comes from that the same um, official record it's actually called census of pakistan uh, volume 2 baluchistan uh, it was accessed as bismillah said in the baluchistan archives department and the next thing dr saib was the uh that how the community members perceive these attacks against themselves. Uh, it's, it's, it, it would not be surprising to say that uh, most of our participants that we interviewed, they, they, they very clearly stated, it's also very extensively touched and, and, and uh, uh, touched upon in the, in the report that they perceive these, these attacks against themselves as genocide. Uh, there are uh, very uh, detailed uh, quotations and, and 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 analysis that we have provided uh, that 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 exemplifies that how the community members in Quetta perceive these attacks as genocide um, against them. Thank you, um, my son John. We have got a few questions. We had um, Dr. Khadija Aposi with us um, who raised her hand, but I cannot see her anymore. Dr. Sab, if you're there, the floor is yours. Uh, she had a meeting. She had to go, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, we have got another um, question from Imran Manzur. Uh, Mr. Manzur, you could uh, could you please unmute yourself and ask your question? Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you uh, very much. Uh, I would first of all congratulate um, the authors of the report for bringing uh, this very. Uh, untouched topic about the Hazaras of Quetta, especially because I come from the same same community, same place, um, and I'm very much excited. Uh, I'm looking forward to reading the whole report and being the student of peace and conflict studies. I think it is going to be even more um, 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 uh, beneficial to me, and uh, yes, it can aid to the uh, to the further. It can be used for, for future use also. I had a couple of, um, um, especially uh, before asking my question, I had uh, talking about this, uh, the census thing, the population of the Hazaras. I think 600,000 right now is um, too much, I think. Um, living, coming from the same place, I think I would say the Hazaras in Quetta are around about 250,000. And the 600,000 figure is just kind of the rhetoric to just show yourself more in numbers in Quetta. And Pakistan, if I'm not wrong, the census is not done on the basis of ethnicity. It's more done on the basis of language. The recent, uh, um, I mean, it, it is, government is going to hold um, one in census in coming days. And only after it, I think some of it sounds like a rhetoric. Uh, I wanted to uh, uh, um, suggest the the, um, the authors that some of the things, I mean, in the slides even, it sounded like a rhetoric. For example, the Hazaras in 2002 or 2003 formed a political party. It is a rhetoric. I mean, and again, it can be debated. Uh, Mr. Manzur, I'm very sorry to interrupt you. Could you please uh, briefly ask your question? We are um, yeah, running my, out of time. My question is about framing. When you call it genocide, 
and not sectarian and ethnic, but but the perpetrators are more genocide. I mean, the perpetrators that you have named, Lashkari Jangavi, Sepai Sahaba, IESK, they are all uh, they are all sectarian groups. Do you really think so that Hazara killings in Pakistan are genocide? I mean, when you see when you see it in isolation and you you just ignore whatever has been happening. I mean, Tehrike Taliban Pakistan uh, killed seventy thousand Pakistan in the whole Pakistan from two thousand and seven till two thousand and fifteen sixteen. And if it is a genocide, then who is the perpetrator here? Who is benefiting from this genocide? Thank you, Mr. Manzur. Bismillah, would you like to take that question, please? Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, actually, yes. Um, so the thing is, uh, we've uh, conducted 80 interviews, um, uh, like mostly over 90% of these interviews have been with people uh, from within the community, people who live um, in the in, 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 in uh, Koita, and one of the authors currently lives in Koita. So um, Manzur Aziz, um, I think you're not the only one who lives in Koita. Um, the figures um, that are provided to us are from the community leaders and others who are also living in Koita, and they have some sort of estimations from their community engagements um, um, and uh, other sources. Um, so basically, the figure that we present is also an estimation. There is no such uh, official census in that way. And if there is a census, not all of the Hazaras participate in the census for various reasons. Um, I think nearly half of the Hazaras don't participate in, the, uh, in, the, in those censuses. Uh, for obvious reasons. That's one. Uh, another thing is our report, um, it will be out soon and you will be able to um, read it uh, thoroughly. Um, we don't claim in that sense that it's only and only genocide. Uh, we say that the concept of genocide captures more of the dimensions of these attacks. And that of course, um, there are other concepts like crimes against humanity as well. Uh, but the concept of genocide does not preclude um, the religious um, aspect of that either, because in the definition of genocide, it's uh, destruction of a community, fully or partially, a community or a group based on ethnicity or based on religion. So if you destroy a religious group, uh, partially or fully, according to the definition that's also genocide. It's not that if you kill people uh, because of their membership in a religious community, then in that sense, it's not uh, genocide. So that's a big, um, actually, um, discussion, um, but it's not mutually exclusive. Thank you, Bismillah. Um, my son, do you have anything to add? <laughs> Uh, a very quick thing, Anis John. Um, I think um, Mr. Manzoor, I think he would definitely agree with that. Uh, that, uh, as Bismillah said, not all of the Hazaras in Quetta and across Pakistan, they, they register in the census. We, the, in the census uh, that, that, that was conducted in 2017, uh, that's a, an official uh, census in Pakistan. There, there, there are various reasons that they do not, as Bismillah just generally touched that, but I will be more specific. The first reason is that not all Hazaras uh, hold the CNIC, that Pakistani um, national ID card. Uh, you know, most of the Hazaras here live on POR card, which is a which is a issued by by the Pakistani government only to you know to allow the Hazaras to live here, and that that only registers that. Uh, and even some Hazaras, uh, they do not, even if they have the Pakistani ID, they, in some cases, they do not register because they would have this, this you know, uh, resettlement cases, and they would more prefer to use their, um, if, 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 like, of course, they are all, like, most of all uh, dual citizens, they would, they would, they would uh, prefer to use their Afghani, uh, you know, uh, national identity. And, 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 and in that sense, I mean, there are two specific reasons, but there are other reasons that they that the report touches more in, in details that why the authors believe that this is uh, a very, an estimation that's more close to reality. Uh, just just wanted to touch to that and John. over to you. Thank you so much, my son John. Uh, we have already run out of time. 
There is um, a last question that I'm going to ask. It's from Mehsan Darwish. Uh, this is a two-part question from the authors. Uh, the question is, has the data of the victims been collected uh, based on the gender and age gap? And the second part is, what is your recommendations for related organizations? Bismillah, would you like to take this question, please? Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll speak to the first part of the question and I'll leave the second part to my son. Uh, maybe that way we'll uh, take less time. Well, um, first of all, yes. The, um, most of the data is, is collected um, in a way that it shows age and gender. But then it's very difficult, really. It's very difficult to um, um, always, in these cases, um, have a complete data set with all of the uh, details. Because in most of the cases, attacks have taken place and they have gone underreported or unreported totally. So it's, uh, it's a bit difficult, but um, we've tried our best. Uh, one of the things that I just wanted to add here is um, our um, attempt as um, researchers to rehumanize the accounts of the systematic attacks against the Hazaras. We have done it in two ways. One is that we have tried, um, um, to a large extent, we have tried to uh, rehumanize it by giving names to the victims. Uh, or nearly, like more than 95% of all of the victims have names uh, in the chronology that we've provided at the end of this report. That's number one. So when you read the names, you'll clearly see uh, their gender. And you're uh, in, 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 the, in case where like we talk about the number of people who are killed, of course we present um, the gender in the, in the graph as well. But if you read the chronologies of the attacks, the killed, those who are killed in the attacks have been named. We found their names. Uh, so so that's, that's very important. But not in all cases have we been able to, uh, to register um, age. We have tried in all cases where it's possible. I think it should be over 80% of all mm -hmm. of the, those people who are killed um, recorded with ages. Um, of course, this is an estimation. We don't have any percentage of those, but we have tried all what we could to uh, include names and ages and profession um, and, and those things uh, in the listings. Thank you, Bismillah. Oh, and the other thing, sorry, very briefly, one sentence. And the other thing um, that we have tried to rehumanize the accounts is by providing those uh, and, and presenting those mini life stories. Those are very poignant, uh, poignant um, very difficult to read. Uh, short, compact stories of 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 victimhood and of suffering um, that show the different layers of the consequences of these attacks on personal, family, and collective levels. Thank you, Bismillah John. My John, the question I will just repeat for you. Uh, it is, what is um, your recommendations for related organizations? This is again from Ehsan Darwish. Um, and it's John, thank you. Uh, uh, actually, the question is not very clear to me uh, if uh, uh, if Mr. Darwish has asked about uh, specific uh, recommendations that we have for uh, the Pakistani government. Yes, if if that is the um, uh, that's the intention of the question. Yes, uh, we have included specific actions that that needs to be uh, taken and uh, by the uh, uh, by the provincial government in uh, in Balochistan the federal government which is the which is the own pakistani state and the uh, and the international community but of course we have also uh, uh, we have also highlighted very specific actions that that need to be taken into account and addressed by the pakistani media uh, the pakistani the, the, the research entities uh, 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 and and rights organizations so 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 there are four you know elements of recommendations uh, hopefully, uh, Mr. Darwish, when reading the report, uh, will come across those uh, recommendations. Thank you very much, Mr. John. Uh, we are nearing the end of the event, so I'm going to just quickly wrap up. Uh, once again, congratulations to Mr. Ali Zoda and Mr. el uh, on such an important achievement. And thank you for your commitment and dedication to the cause of justice. Uh, on behalf of uh, Prusish uh, Policy Research Institute, I would like to thank our guests for their invaluable insights and our participants for taking part in the discussion. Uh, as mentioned earlier, the report will be published later today by the by Prestige Policy uh, Research Institute. 
you can access their report on the institute's website. Dr. Akbar, do you, do you have a question? Sorry, I, I just saw that. No, I know we are over time. I was just going to add one sentence very quickly at the end, just to um, make it more complicated, what it already has been the discussion in the last um, quarter of the hour about whether it's a genocide or persecution. I was just going to mention at the end that now that we are going to move beyond this, um, the security approach that the Pakistani state has taken uh, for the community or the so-called uh, ghettoization. Um, and what one of the interviewees I think called um, the open air uh, prison of the community in that particular areas. And then the experiences and consequences of the otherness that the community experience um, uh, and, and the boundaries and the limit that this sort of security approach has drawn um, around the community in a way uh, thinking that it's protecting but in another way it's also enabling another crime against the community which could be very much um, relate or interpreted as an apartheid uh, 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 protecting the community from genocide but it also enabling um, another crime which is apartheid I think this security approach is not working and I think at the bottom or, or at the end of the day we have to tackle that that, that very important one that what has been done so far I mean um, attacks have declined yes but the consequences on the community is huge the toll it's taking the mental and then the the all economical or other other aspect is is huge and it's enabling another crime and 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 we need to like look look into that as well as researchers um, about it. I just wanted to mention that point. Sorry, Anis. Thank you. That's totally fine. Thank you so much, Doctor. Um, as um, I mentioned earlier, uh, the report will be published today by uh, Prestige Policy Research Institute. You can access the report on the institute's website. And also, I just want to um, say that I sincerely hope that we see the day when no one is killed because of their identity because of who they are, a day when being a Hazara is not a crime. Uh, it has been uh, my honor uh, to moderate this discussion. Thank you so much, everyone. I wish you all um, a good afternoon and for the office. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, yeah. Thank you, Shabahair. Thank uh, you. Thank you, everybody. Take care, uh, have, uh, have a lovely evening. Uh, weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, back. Dr. Sarfanda and Dr. Melissa. In, in your cases, you've been staying up so late and we really appreciate it. Thank Almost you so much. It's 3 a.m. here. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. I feel so bad. No worries. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.